Well, welcome to Fireside Chat. As you can see, we are on location, just like the other daytime programs. Uh, we don't have, we have many more hosts uh, on our uh, daytime show than maybe what you see on TV. Uh, but we're looking forward to, to sharing with you a little bit about what our apartments now look like and how we now market to our uh, future residents by being able to show them a fully staged and complete apartment that can help people visualize how they will be living at Horizon House. So hopefully you're going to enjoy the tour as you see uh, different interviews with different uh, uh, participants today that shows off uh, how the apartment looks all around. I want to uh, begin by saying, as always, thank you so much to all the residents for your amazing ability and willingness to follow the rules uh, and to, to work with us during this different uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, we depend on you for our safety and everyone has done a terrific job, uh, especially wearing the facial coverings. Uh, remember that the facial coverings really are about keeping your neighbors safe more so than it is about keeping you safe. So even though maybe it's not something you feel a need to do or want to do, please do so for the benefit of your neighbors. I've also been amazed at how well we all recognize each other uh, with our face masks on. I, I think everyone has recognized me. I've recognized most people. Uh, so uh, they're effective uh, to, for safety, but uh, we can still see who each other is. But the one thing that's getting a little bit wacky is the hair. Not having the salon open has made all of us having a little bit of a hair problem. Uh, and many of us are starting to look a little bit like we did many years ago. In fact, here is one of me many years ago. And I bet that uh, each of you has a big hair picture from some other time in your life. And I thought it might be kind of fun to have a little bit of a contest that if you send your photo of a previous time in life with big hair to Beth, then we'll put together a little contest where we'll have residents try to guess who the other resident is uh, as they're well disguised in their new or old haired style. So please forward those on to Beth and we'll see if we can have a little bit of fun with that. Well, we have a lot of good things to cover today and you'll be hearing from lots of folks uh, on good information. So we're glad you're here and participating. Uh, we'd certainly love to be doing this live with all of you in the room, but we're going to do our very best even though that isn't uh, our opportunity for right now. I want to talk a little bit about uh, our COVID assumption. It's a repeat from before, but it's kind of the foundation of why we are uh, uh, doing what we're doing and how we're doing it. Talk a little bit about uh, the uh, COVID-19 and the challenges ahead. It becomes increasingly more difficult as we march forward. And then a reminder of what our process is. So you know how we arrive at the decisions we arrive at. So our operating assumption is essentially that the coronavirus is here to stay for the foreseeable future. And until there is a, uh, a vaccine, there's a definite possibility that this is likely to emerge. So that is why we operate in a very careful, methodical, and uh, slow, incremental way. Uh, we want to make sure that we do not get ahead of ourselves, that we keep everybody safe. Uh, you may have heard, if not, till you'll hear it here today, that we are COVID free and that is huge and we want to stay that way and we think a big part of staying that way is continuing to manage how we open up services and spaces and how we conduct ourselves uh, with respect to the safe practices and behaviors. Now, with respect to the challenges ahead, uh, there's a lot of inconsistent national response uh, and guidance. Uh, there was a time when there seemed to be a more coordinated approach, uh, albeit maybe loosely coordinated. But what we're finding now is there's a lot of disinformation, there's a lot of conflicting information, and it gives lots of people reason to hear a point of view and think maybe we ought to be running with that particular point of view. Uh, we find that, that the CDC is also presenting very conflicting information. Uh, they, uh, some of it is just legitimate backtracking on a particular procedure that may be not as relevant today as it once was. And in some cases, they may be under some pressure to communicate a certain message that is not entirely consistent with their previous messaging. 
So we are also experiencing you know, continuous uh, disinformation around testing, what's available, how it works, what it purpose it serves. And so you'll see things in the paper that talk about uh, that wide-based uh, uh, testing is available, and it simply is not. Uh, we work on this every day. Uh, we want to make sure that we have testing available so we can understand the nature of uh, the health of our population at any point in time. But so far, that is not available on the basis that we would like. Also, state and uh, uh, specific organizations have a little bit of a division. Uh, we follow the, uh, the state guidelines uh, set down by Governor uh, Inslee. But we also recognize that our environment is different than the environment that might uh, apply to a, a restaurant or a hotel or some other organization. So we won't follow everything verbatim from uh, Governor Inslee because our population is more vulnerable and we need to be more cautious. Uh, we really do chart our course though with the state and with the King County Health. There are primary guides to what, we're, what we do. And to that end, our process is that we follow the state and county guidelines. Uh, we make and review specific application to Horizon House. And we may lag the state and the county simply because, again, of our vulnerable population. The tough part in all of this is the logic stream is not perfect. I will often have residents who will come down and say, but why can't I do this because it looks a lot like this and you're allowing this. And I do get that there is a lot breakdown in the logic. And we know that and we're watching ourselves be somewhat inconsistent. And the reason we do that is because that it's critical that we not move too quickly uh, and just let everything open up and then find ourselves having to pull back very hard if there is another outbreak. So bear with us as we kind of march through this process. So far, everyone has been uh, uh, cooperating in, in the best possible way, and we're so appreciative. Uh, and it won't get easier in some ways because there will be so many different points of view out there that uh, people will feel we should be doing something different. Uh, we follow a, a phased-in process, uh, and we review those phases uh, each day uh, as we sit down at our 930 COVID meeting, and we evaluate what the state is saying, uh, what the county is saying, what is in our various phases, how well we are able to open up and secure a place and to, to safely clean a, a space. And then we open something else up and we continue to refine our process. So hopefully this is something that you are experiencing as a positive uh, incremental opening of things. Uh, and uh, it's not too fast, but hopefully it's not too slow. So thank you again for all of your help. And now I want to pass things off to Lori, who's going to give us more specific information about uh, COVID-19. Thanks, and I'll catch up with you in a little bit later as we talk through some questions. Good morning. It's great to be back with all of you. I'm going to be providing some updates on several different topics. After originally thinking I didn't have anything to present, I was wrong. So I'm gonna present uh, some virus case updates where we're at with that whole COVID-19 situation. I'll also update you on where we're at with broad-based testing. I know that's a topic that has been uh, hugely discussed in a lot of different sources. Uh, the visitor policy, and then I'll wrap up with some dining services updates. As you will have heard from Mike, I, it is such an exciting, monumental time in Horizon House history, really, to be able to say that our outbreak is officially over. Many of us have uh, certain events that we remember throughout our life. I'm going to remember vividly Saturday, March 28th, when I got that call with the uh, unfortunate news that we had our first case. And uh, we are now finally two months later uh, declared COVID free as well as outbreak free by King County Public Health. I was just notified by them yesterday that given our current information, they are closing our case officially in terms of uh, the outbreak that started for us on March 28th. So our last two final residents, one in independent living, one in supported living, both underwent two recent two-step testing process and were declared to be negative. So we have no active cases in our community at this time. Just so thrilled with that. 
And we still have three supported living employees who remain out in their final recovery stages. And we hope to see them returning uh, possibly next week. They were out in the early uh, process of this uh, outbreak and have had some complications along the way. And we we'll look forward to having them return. A question that came to us uh, for the fireside chat was the charts that are reflected in the communications that go out weekly or sometimes more often. Certainly isn't the total number. And so a reminder that when we send out those communications on a weekly basis or more often, the cases reflected are what's current and active. Certainly has not captured the totality of their cases. And I thought you might be interested in knowing what have those final numbers been because it's easy to lose track of that over the time. So to date, since the beginning, March 28th, we had a total number of five supported living residents who tested positive for COVID and four independent living residents. On the staff side, we had a total of 10 supported living employees positive with COVID and two non-supported living team members positive. Uh, sadly, we lost uh, three supported living residents and one independent living resident uh, to COVID-19 related deaths. So I am so hopeful that we will not see any more cases and for that to happen, it requires all of us to continue being vigilant, vigilant both here at Horizon House and when we venture outside of Horizon House to continue with social distancing, continue wearing your face cloth coverings or mask. And I really want to empower all of us, staff and residents alike, to remind each other if we ever are without our mask or face cloth coverings to please, please put them on. I have received ongoing occasional reports of some not wearing those uh, coverings. And if not for yourself, please think about others. So I do ask that you always have your face mask uh, or cloth coverings when outside of your apartments and for employees when here at Horizon House as well as outside of Horizon House. As more and more things open up to the outside, it simply increases more risk for all of us and we want to work so hard to keep this virus out of our community for all of us and for our safety and health. So thank you for all that you're continuing to do to uh, impart that safety and health for all of us. So we'll hopefully keep that out. Switching gears to the broad-based testing, I know it's been a lot of information out in the media reports. Uh, certainly over the last couple of months, there have been emails that have come in, phone calls, inquiring why are some communities getting broad-based testing and not Horizon House. And, and I just want to share that there's been a lot of misinformation out in the news media about that broad-based testing. What I can share is that I have been participating weekly in calls that are being put on by the King County um, Health Department, Department of Health, Department of Social and Health Services, DSHS, and Leading Age is also on those calls. And so this is for providers and administrators of senior living communities, assisted living, nursing homes, and the latest information that we have, you may have heard that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, has handed down a mandate at the federal level that all skilled nursing facilities across the country must do broad-based testing of all patients or residents and staff members. That mandate is to be completed by the end of this month. It is not going to happen because of the lack of access to so many test kits. And so at this juncture here at the Washington State level, the Department of Health has been tasked with developing a plan for broad-based testing in all long-term care settings. The health departments across the state are overwhelmed. They are um, adhering to a lot of different audiences, not just senior living. So Department of Health is now tasked with taking on the development of a plan to get broad-based testing into long-term care communities. At this juncture, the priority is to come up with a plan to get all skilled nursing facilities tested first and foremost to comply with the federal mandate that is now before us. The state is anticipating moving from there with a testing plan for assisted living, memory care, and adult family homes. The big questions on the table right now in terms of those mandates is how are we going to get access to all those test kits? 
who's going to perform the testing, and who's going to pay for all that testing. That's especially a concern for many of our providers who are Medicaid, who have predominantly Medicaid uh, constituents, and so that's a big question that the state is still sorting through. The goal at this juncture, based on the conference call last week, is to get assisted living and adult family homes memory cares done by the end of June, is the goal. They made it clear that for any communities that have been able to get broad-based testing through other sources, after April 1st will be lower on the priority list. So it means that we had a very fortunate inside track with George Counts and getting us some testing both for supported living residents and staff. We would not be in a priority list when assisted living becomes um, eligible for testing because we did undergo some broad-based testing after April 1st. Hard to say at this juncture at what point we may be back on the docket for that. I will share that independent living, broad-based testing within senior living communities is simply not on the radar at this time. Uh, the first priority is for those in the facilities I've just shared. I have raised the question in a couple of those conference calls about independent living uh, residents within senior communities, and it's, it's not being answered at this time. I know that there have been some communities with inside tracks or connections that have been able to get broad-based testing, and it's fortunate that they have been able to. I'm sorry that we have not been able to get access to enough test kits for all of our independent living residents and hope as more and more testing is becoming available that that will be a reality for the Horizon House community. In the meantime, we do have test kits available for residents symptomatic. We do not have access to any test kits that can be provided for asymptomatic residents at this time. So I'll certainly keep you posted as more and more information becomes available on what's going to uh, carry forward with the plans. The considerations um, around that again is anybody who's been tested after April 1st, lower priority, get through skilled nursing first, no nursing homes, and then move on to assisted living and memory care. So more to come, and certainly we'll make sure to get communication out on that effort. The other uh, big issue before us is the visitor policy in terms of what uh, is currently in place and what the considerations are as the no visitor policy is modified. For those of you who may not be aware, this no visitor policy is actually a federal and state mandate that's currently in place. Horizon House chose to implement that policy several days actually before the mandate came down. We felt it was the right thing to do. We started experiencing some cases here and we felt that was a prudent step to take. And then in short order, that mandate came down at the state level as well as the federal for nursing homes. At this juncture, uh, the latest thinking, again on these conference calls I've been participating is, the state is wrestling with when to modify the no visitor policy and the thinking is to not implement any modification until phase four of Governor Inslee's phased approach plan. Phase four, if it goes as planned at this point in time, it would be around July 7. Now that being said, I can share that in these weekly conference calls with the various state agencies in King County Public Health, Providers and administrators, we are expressing great concern about the emotional toll this is taking on our residents without having those family visits. Dr. James Lewis, who is a well-respected uh, physician with King County Public Health, has had to remind us as providers and administrators that we are in a pandemic and the senior population that we serve in these facilities is the highest risk population. So Dr. Lewis is acknowledging the emotional toll that the social isolation is taking, the hardship this creates for family members as well, of course, for the residents, but that we must protect our higher risk population. And so there is a lot of conversation taking place right now at the governor's office and working in collaboration with the state agencies. And I'm hoping that we will know more possibly in the next week or two if there's going to be any flexibility built into when the no visitor policy mandate may change. Uh, again, it's hard to say at this juncture if that will remain in place before any modification until July 7th or if there may be some 
loosening of that restriction sooner. The considerations that the state is talking about, as well as at the federal level, is that loosening or modification of the visitor policy likely will have some correlation with the community being virus free. So in other words, if there were virus or more positive cases that would uh, create flexibility for a facility to close to visitors at any point in time. Uh, PPE availability will be another large consideration for visitors. And the last one is the broad-based testing. That's a real sticky point right now because of the lack of plan for that. There is concern amongst us providers and administrators about such a strong correlation between broad-based testing and the no visitor policy if the state continues to be slow in getting those test kits into our facilities. So we're concerned about um, being too stringent of a mandate associated with the broad-based testing. We'll obviously, like with everything, uh, carefully weigh that out as we look at that visitor policy and determine when it's safe and what, again, flexibility we may have within the constraints imposed by the state and or at the federal level. The broad-based testing, I did forget to mention earlier, there is some planning uh, being discussed around a longer-term goal and plan to have broad-based testing every two weeks of staff within long-term care facilities, including assisted living. Again, no formal plan around that yet, and there is no recommendation at this time for any regular reoccurring broad-based testing for residents in those settings. So more to come. Again, I'll keep you posted on both broad-based testing and the visitor policy as more becomes available at the state level. And finally, just to wrap up with a few dining services updates. Uh, it seems like it's been a while since I've been able to be more fully plugged into dining services with so much of my attention and focus on the COVID-19. But uh, I do want to share with you that we do appreciate the positive feedback that has come from many of you over these last weeks with both the food quality and the customer service from the hostess staff uh, taking your orders to the servers. And certainly at times like this, uh, we always, even in challenging times, want to strive to get things right. So we know that we've missed the mark on some of the recent foods that have been delivered, and uh, we apologize uh, for some of the errors that we've also made on getting the right orders to the right apartments. So please know that we appreciate when you let us know so that we can get that corrected and understand if there are some patterns that we need to look from a systems perspective. So please keep that feedback coming. And also when we're hitting the mark right, because I know it really serves as a great boost for our team members. I do want to let you know that Barry and Chef Steve are continuing to closely monitor the meat plant situation. I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about the meat plants that have been hit hard with the COVID situation. And so sometimes that can lead to some last minute changes of menu offerings based on what supply is able to come in and they will continue to monitor that. They are also, uh, Barry has mentioned that um, shortages are definitely with us and it may become more problematic as restaurants begin to reopen and the food, food supply chains figure out what the demand's going to be and where the demand's going to be. So uh, Barry just uh, encouraged me to mention that we may have some challenges as we move forward over the next few weeks with more and more reopenings, more demand coming in that uh, we may have some last minute changes in menu offerings depending on what supplies get in and what supplies may not be available as more and more begins to reopen in the broader communities. Chef Steve and uh, David, a registered dietitian, are hard at work on coming up with a new menu cycle. They hope to be able to debut a new menu with seasonal offerings that will coincide with the summer months. Uh, in about a month, so you can stay tuned for some hopefully refreshed and uh, some wonderful new offerings for you. Uh, the barbecue uh, is kicking off, so we hope that some of you were able to enjoy the barbecue offerings yesterday, and they will kick off again every Thursday through the summer months. Well, it's a little different right now in that we don't have the full patio all set up as in years past, just bringing that menu offering back we hope will help 
restore a little sense of some normalcy as we all try to get some footing back into a new normal, of course, but I uh, want to also make food offerings uh, fresh and uh, bring the barbecue season back for you. You may notice that as you are getting out and about more, the Patera's dining room looks a little different. It's been largely a storage space for a lot of the boxes, holding the paper goods, the compostable goods to get all the meals out. We've moved a lot of that uh, stock over to the bistro, which of course remains closed. And we've also been setting up some tables and chairs in the dining room just to start planning for when it will be safe to reopen the terrace dining room in some capacity. We're not there yet. We're still a little ways out from that. But I want to assure you that we're being proactive and looking ahead and understanding what's going to be safe. We're certainly staying in touch with all the different uh, food vendors and uh, best practices as restaurants reopen. We'll certainly learn from those experiences as to how we can ensure the best and safe dining experience in the terrace dining room. So. All of those things are being uh, planned and we're just uh, taking a, a test run, if you will, at what's going to be possible, how many reservations we might be able to accommodate, what social distancing looks like, traffic patterns in and out of the terrace dining room. So it may be changing over the coming weeks as we continue to fine tune and prepare for some eventual reopening of that space. And last, uh, certainly last but not least, uh, we are seeing again as more residents are out and about. Uh, some of you are stopping by the hostess desk down on the first floor to place your orders. Uh, certainly if you happen to be in the area, we're happy to accommodate that. In general though, we do ask that you continue calling to place your meal orders just because that hostess stand right now is, is very busy. A lot of calls coming in for meal orders and so sometimes the hostesses are tied up on the phone or listening to voicemails. So uh, while it, again we're happy to accommodate you but if at all possible we would like to continue encouraging uh, calling in those orders at this time. So we'll certainly keep you posted as things shift on that front and as we maybe can consider some other options. I'm so pleased to see uh, Chef Steve and Barry and the food services team continuing to try to find those moments of surprise and delight, add some little special touches. We recognize that it, it can be tiring and fatiguing to have somewhat the same routine things happening. And so I really appreciate when they come up with some creative ideas to keep things fresh and uh, try to keep um, too much routine. And we certainly will be continuing to work hard to restore some element of uh, dining services as we've known in the past with some new twist for again everyone's health and safety. So thank you, that's what I have to report for this fireside chat. It's great to see more of you out and about and to see some of the shining eyes behind the mask. A reminder to please continue wearing those face cloth coverings or masks, social distancing, stay safe, and I will keep you apprised as more information comes from the various agencies on broad-based testing and the visitor policy. Uh, supported living does remain on more of the strict quarantine, so we're not at a position yet where we can support supported living residents leaving SL to enjoy the larger Horizon House community, but hopefully before long we can support that. But know that with no active cases, those residents are out for walks within supported living, enjoying the common spaces again. So it's, it's been wonderful to see them coming out and seeing some restoration of vitality for those residents who have been in strict room quarantine for much longer. So things are, things are starting to look up. I certainly am appreciating having a less intensity of the first few weeks of our outbreak. So it's been a joy to see uh, a little lightheartedness in the times compared to where we were uh, in late March and April. So thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Doris and Herb for a philanthropy update. Take care. Good morning. My partners in caring, co-chair Herb Reinert and I would like to thank those residents who have so generously contributed to the Partners in Caring campaign, despite the fact that we have been unable to have the usual social events that 
the beginning of the campaign as we usually do. First, you may recall that the 2000, uh, to, excuse me, the 2020, the 2020 annual Partners in Caring campaign began on March 11th when you found a letter and a delicious pink cookie in your mail cubby. You may also recall that we had a very generous $50,000 match challenge during that period from an anonymous donor. Gifts and pledges that uh, came in were that would come in by April 30th would be matched by this donor. And congratulations, we made it. Secondly, I have some good news, bad news to report to you. The good news first. Already we have received $233,000 in contributions from residents and businesses. And the endowment fund is closing in on its goal, the goal of $75,000. We have already received $73,000 in that fund. So a great beginning to our campaign. The bad news is that this year, because of the continuing meeting restrictions, we'll be unable to hold our July ice cream social as usual. However, we are planning something special in July to mark the event, and we hope to mark, to return to our annual get together next year. And now from my co-chair Herb, 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 where are you? <laughs> I was thinking about all of the things that we've lost when we've been in quarantine and uh, in the last few months. We've lost most of the interaction with each other. We've lost any hugs. We've lost our smiles. We've lost the coffee and the tea and the juice in the, in the lounge. We've lost meeting people in the elevator and in the post office. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought about the fact that what we lost is what somebody who was here and who, through no fault of their own, ran out of money, would feel like if they had to leave Horizon House. And that's what makes this program the Residence Assistance Fund so significant because think about it. If somebody was a resident here and had lost their money and needed help to stay here, they would be in a position like us, having to leave what makes Horizon House Horizon House. You couldn't travel in this time. You couldn't eat out. You couldn't go shopping and spend your money. So I want you to think about the fact that you've got piles of money that you didn't anticipate having. And what are you going to do with it? You have a golden opportunity to give it to Partners in Caring, to the Residence Assistance Fund, to people who ran out of money, need money, from us in order to stay. It costs almost a million dollars a year on that program. You lost, you have all that money to give to the area of greatest need or to the staff scholarship program. So think about it. Think about what it means to be a member of Horizon House. Think about what we're looking to find again when we finally get back into normalcy and think about giving more than you ever thought you would give to this particular program, to the Residence Assistance Fund, to Partners in Caring. If for no other reason, think about it in these terms. 
Doris and I are the co-chairs this year. And we don't want to be the only co-chairs in history that didn't raise the amount of money that we set out to raise, that didn't reach our goals. So think about it, dig deep in your pockets, and give and give and give for partners in caring. I'll give you an update of our campus improvements, starting with the projects that we currently have underway. All the activity is up on our roof. It started off as a roof project, which is essentially complete. We need about four consecutive days of good weather, uh, but you know that, that work is complete. However, it transformed into an exterior wall project. So the new roof needs to tie into the exterior wall. As we were cutting into the exterior wall, it was discovered that there's a lot of water infiltration. Uh, Wind-driven rain has gotten behind the stucco. Sheathing needs to be replaced. Uh, there's rust, there's mold, and uh, that's turned into a project that when putting it through permitting appears to require uh, some structural upgrades. We expect all this work to be finished by September. As far as upcoming projects, uh, we have uh, the Fireside Lounge. Actually, before that, we'll talk about the, uh, the first floor carpet refresh. We expect some designated areas on the first floor to have new carpet and new paints before the end of June, and then the rest of the carpet will um, be completed by July or August, depending on the uh, lead time of those products. For the Fireside Lounge, we hope to mobilize uh, that project before the end of June, maybe the beginning of July. Uh, that project should just take a couple of months, two or three months. And then the Radiant Heat Project, the one that we've been working on for over a year, uh, it's the corridor project of the Central Tower and East Tower. Uh, it requires a thermostat replacements of central tower apartments. That project, we're not quite sure when we'll be able to begin that project. Because of the COVID-19, it doesn't seem like a safe time to uh, put a bunch of contractors in the corridors and inside uh, resident apartments for uh, such a long duration. And then uh, finally, Anderson Hall. Anderson Hall, we're putting that design on pause just uh, momentarily. We hope to start the design in July after we feel good about the progress of uh, the previous projects I just mentioned. And that's about it, thank you. Greetings, this is Peter Shapiro with news from the Residence Council. Well, the election season is upon us and I'm not talking about the race for the White House. I'm talking about something very local. It's the time of year to begin the process of nominating and electing new members of the Residence Council. There are 15 elected positions, members who serve three-year terms. They're staggered so that every year we elect five new people to serve, another three -year, serve their three-year terms. A nominating, a nominating committee chaired by Laura Weiss has been hard at work planning the details of this year's procedure. You will have received an announcement in your mailroom cubbies earlier this morning. It invites you to help form the next generation of residence council by submitting the names of people you believe would serve our community well. There are suggestions of factors you might want to consider in making your choices. You can make as many choices as you wish you can nominate yourself. At the bottom of the notice you will have received, there is a place for stating your nominations and submitting them. The submission takes place in any one of three boxes, one in the mail room, one in the fireside room, and one in the front lobby. The uh, nominating committee will be interviewing the people nominated and presenting a slate for election next fall. Nominations are now open. They're open today. The deadline for nominations is Friday, June 19th. If you have any questions, please feel free to call members of the nominating committees 
uh, they are listed at the bottom of the announcement. The Residents Council is your council, it is our council. Please help us to keep it strong and working for all of us. Now, a word from our sponsor. Residents Council News is Fact, in fact, everything your residence council does is brought to you by your friendly neighborhood Monday market. And it all begins with you, the residents who donate items and who shop when the market is able to operate. The coronavirus pandemic, of course, brought traditional operations to a halt last March. The question was, how and when could the market again open safely? As with all activities during the pandemic, Monday Market will get back to work slowly and carefully. Business operations will be different than they were before. Your Monday Market has now received permission from the COVID-19 Task Force to begin phase one of its new operations. You can find the new rules of operation in the alert on HH Connect HHTV channel 370, and in various locations, the mailroom and, and others throughout Horizon House. Operations will start with Monday Market Safe Donation Days. Monday Market will begin accepting donations using a new experimental system. You will be allowed to bring your donations on a strict building by building system with specific hours on specific days to a specific place. There are just a few hours each day. Right now, those hours and those days will be on Monday, June 1, and Wednesday, June 3. The place, the only place, will be the furniture annex in the West Wing E-Level garage. Please read the posted and distributed information carefully. Please strictly observe the building by building schedule. Strictly follow all other requirements. Wear your face covering, observe all social distancing rules and all requirements for your safety and the safety of the community. In other news, the Horizon House community has been embracing new video conferencing technology. Committees are meeting and beginning to present programs electronically in these days when we cannot gather in person. For example, the State Tax Committee invited Senator Jamie Peterson to appear remotely earlier this month. He presented news of the recent legislative session and answered residents' questions. Other committees have been showing films on HHTV channel 370 and following the film with discussions using video te te technology, video conferencing technology. Look for announcements of these opportunities in the new version of the weekly alert. They're listed along with the exercise classes, movies, and other programs. If the program will include video conferencing opportunities for discussion and questions, there will be a link in the announcement which will take you directly to the meeting. These are exciting uses of new technology, and they will expand as we all learn more about the opportunities. You could think of them as our virtual version of our famous Horizon House secret sauce. Feel free to give me a call if you have any questions about what's going on in this regard. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Ruth Eller, who has exciting news about July 4th. Good morning, friends. Since the usual summer picnic cannot be held this year, the picnic committee is planning a virtual picnic that you will be able to enjoy in your own apartments. Chef Steve will offer an expanded menu with more choices at dinner. At about 1.30 in the afternoon, we'll have a a sing-along that we can enjoy in our apartments. It will be, naturally, a virtual sing-along. At around 4 o'clock, there will be music in our halls. 
and you can listen just by opening your doors. Dinner will be available from 5 to 7. And at 7.30, a surprise movie. It will be terrific. More news is coming, so stay tuned. This is from me, Ruth Eller, the Picnic Committee Chair, and all of the committee. Thanks. Good morning, and greetings from the Board of Trustees. I just want to remind you that there are 13 people on the board. Four of us are Horizon House residents. Bob Klein, Jim Fitzgerald, who is an emeritus member, Peter Shapiro, president of the Residence Council, and me, Ann Brand, who is serving as president of the board for this year and the next. Mike has been keeping us current on the events and procedures that have been in place since this pandemic began. We hear from him and his team at least weekly. All of us on the board congratulate every participant in this community for their acceptance of and adaptation to living very differently. Living here myself, I experienced this firsthand. The other people on the board express wonder and profound appreciation for how we are doing. The board met via Zoom on May 12. As you can imagine, the bulk of the meeting was taken up with reviewing our progress in meeting the challenges and in trying to use the data we have, as well as what we anticipate, to forecast where we are headed. We have the extraordinary advantage of going into this crisis in a very strong position, and we expect to weather it well. Clark Newber performed the independent audit of Horizon House. Our finance and audit committees had a virtual meeting with the auditors to review their findings prior to the board meeting. Bob George, treasurer of the board, reported to us that we had a, quote, squeaky clean, close quote, audit. The auditors complimented quite openly the consistently excellent work of our CFO, Christy Seymour, and her staff. As you may remember, although it seems a long time ago now, the board intended to embark on a formal strategic planning process last fall. The plan was to complete the process by September. Well, we all know what happened to that plan. However, we are going to restart in June using the virtual meeting tools we use as second nature now. In closing, we all on the board are admiring your success, your willingness to find ways to make these circumstances work with forbearance and good humor. Your creativity in developing doable workarounds is amazing. We will need all that creativity and energy to find how, in the era of masks and social distancing, we can reignite with new solutions, the vitality and engagement that are the hallmarks, the secret sauce of Horizon House. Have a good day. Well, now we have a few bright spots. And one, of course, is uh, repeating ourselves about thanking everyone for their great uh, cooperation and help in managing through this COVID uh, experience. Uh, we've done a great job so far. I want to continue to work at it. We also have, uh, want to thank the Residence Council for all the terrific notes that they sent to many of the staff. I think, in fact, it might have been all of the staff. Uh, that was a, a wonderful gesture of appreciation. I also want to mention that residents have been very appreciative of food service and the great job they've been doing with, with uh, being able to come up with good creative menus. In fact, that menu is about to change, so there'll be some new things coming out here shortly. Uh, they've done a great job on the delivery service, and I hear uh, many compliments from residents about how well that has worked. So thanks for uh, the food service team, and thanks for residents acknowledging their good work. I also want to mention that we are uh, in a collaboration with Amazon and a company called K4 Connect to bring uh, Echo Dots uh, into Horizon House that we will be able to then uh, allow for voice recognition uh, and residents will be able to ask Alexa through their Echo Dot uh, about Horizon House events. Uh, they'll be able to call the front desk, be able to call the salon and call valet and dining directly through the device. So this is a collaboration we have with Amazon and uh, K4 Connect to try out this technology at Horizon House and see if it is a helpful tool. We know that some of our residents are visually impaired, so the opportunity to have something that is an audible 
is a much better solution than something that is exclusively visual. But other residents may find this an easy way to get information and to make the calls internally into Horizon House that they need to make. So you'll be seeing that in the coming weeks and we'll give it a try and we'll see what works and what doesn't and improve from there. <clears throat> the bright spot of cards are available at the front desk so please pick one up if you would like to acknowledge the staff and appreciate their work. Everyone likes to be appreciated so feel free to pick up a card and write a note to your favorite department or staff member. Thank you for joining in on Fireside Chat. Uh, it's not exactly how we used to do it, but it is a good way to do it in the meantime until we can all get back to being in a room together and sharing the experience. Thanks so much, and we'll see you soon.